All right. So I am Benjamin Day. I'm Stephanie Nakajima. And this is Medicare for All, the podcast for everybody who needs health care. And we are bringing it to you today from the United States and from Denmark. Also Copenhagen, Denmark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm here today. I'm here uh, visiting um, a, a terminally ill family member. Unfortunately, my um, my husband's mother is uh, very ill. And um, I was very lucky to be able to come here at all. I take three yeah. flights two corona tests, one right before I got on the plane and one right after I got off. Mm -hmm. So actually, an airport is like the safest place to be right now because <laughs> everybody's been tested. <laughs> I'm going to move into one. <laughs> I think I did for 24 hours there, so mm -hmm. would not recommend it. Um, so today, uh, we have a pretty exciting episode. We're uh, talking about uh, Rep. Pramila Jayapal reintroducing the <clears throat> Medicare for All Act last week um, with a record-breaking number of co-sponsors. Um, we were really happy with how it all went down, and um, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, co-sponsors, who's on the bill, who's not quite yet, who we expected to be, um, how how the launch uh, went down, like how the the representatives who spoke uh, in favor of the bill, and some of the more interesting stories that came out of that, um, and the organizing effort that went into uh, getting this record number of co-sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, so just to to frame it to start, last session in 2018. We launched the bill with 106 original co-sponsors, um, and of course that itself was a record broken from the last session, uh, HR 676. Um, and I actually cannot remember. Do you remember Ben? How many co-sponsors we had on HR 676? Significantly uh, less. I mean, I've been working at healthcare now for what seven years, eight years. I remember sessions where we didn't get more than 30 something co-sponsors yeah. on the bill. I don't remember what it was like in the very last session before Pramila Jayapal took it over. Um, Cause you remember Keith Ellison had the bill for a little while, but mm. we are in like totally different territory compared oh, to yeah. just a handful of years ago. So exactly. I think I remember something like 60, 68, 69, yeah. I think. And I've seen um, worse. <laughs> I, just, I yeah. remember worse. So um, we should get some credit for being there to envision a better future for this bill <laughs> <laughs> from the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, last week again, we, you know, we broke the original co-sponsor record. Um, we, we launched with 112 co-sponsors. So we picked up two immediately after the launch. So, you know, we're actually already up to 114 and it kind of feels like we're on our way to breaking last session's like final co-sponsor tally uh, of 118. So that was, you know, after two full years of organizing on the bill. So, um, Ben, do you think that this is a good co-sponsor number to start with? Yeah, well, it sure beats like 35 or 36 co-sponsors, <laughs> which I, I, I'm telling you, I remember this and it wasn't that many years ago. So I think it is a testament to how far the movement has come. Um, but also you do have to remember that um, usually we, we don't get a lot of co-sponsors between the end of one session and the beginning of the next. Um, I mean, it's literally just like a few weeks and it's a few frenzied weeks during which like every bill is being introduced into Congress. I mean, um, the new bill number 1976 or whatever, that means that literally almost 2000 bills were filed before it, um, to, to the house of representatives. So it, it's not the greatest usually organizing time because every issue-based organization is pushing for the same thing. So usually there's a handful of reps who actually do support Medicare for All. We just You don't get their staff to press the yes button in time before the original co-sponsor launch. So we'll, we'll, we always get more that you know are kind of with us already, but they just didn't go through the, the process of signing on. Um, but also, yeah, it's just like, you know, there, there's not that much organizing time between the end of the last bill and the start of this one. So we actually, I thought there were some surprises at the beginning of this, this session with this bill drop. So, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, a memory device I've used, cause it took me forever to remember HR 1384. And I was sort of sad to see it go. Cause I could, now I can remember the, <laughs> could mm -hmm. finally remember the number. Um, and 1976, it's like a year in recent memory. And, and so the things, the big things that happened in that year was the Montreal Olympics, the Muppet Show debut, <laughs> um, Jimmy Carter was elected to the presidency, 
And also, Star Wars started filming in Tunisia. Yeah. So. And let, let's not forget, it was a 200-year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and in the uh, Ameri- yeah. American Revolution, 1776. So it's like the bicentennial. Um, Whoa, yeah, right. we landed on a good one. I almost wish it was like 1979, <laughs> which is when I was born. And that would be really the best and easiest to remember. Huh. Well, hopefully one of those events triggers a memory for you. So you can have exactly. 1976. So, Stephanie, we were talking about some surprises at, at this bill drop. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in terms of the new co-sponsors, um, what what really struck you just looking at, browsing over the co-sponsor list uh, at the very beginning? Yeah, well, the one that had me dancing in my living room at 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. when I got the email um, was, of course, Frank Pallone, the chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, um, who not only co-sponsored the bill for the first time ever, um, and he's, you know, definitely after the Ways and Means, this is one of the most powerful committees, and he's one of the most powerful chairs, but he also made a commitment to hold a hearing on Medicare for All um, in the committee. and I think, I mean, I think that that was just a huge win uh, for all of the organizers who have been organizing him relentlessly um, for the last, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. for the last uh, many years, actually. Um, right. This is a Jersey, years, Jersey yeah. rep. Oh, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. That's right. New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And for people who, like me, you know, don't really follow, you know, at least, you know, when I first heard about energy and commerce, I was like, well... That doesn't sound like a very important committee for healthcare, but that actually is the healthcare committee in 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 Congress. It's just uh, poorly named for for our purposes. So, um, were there other like kind of um, uh, new sign-ons we picked up for the first time just when the bill was being dropped, Stephanie? Or uh, yeah, um, so just one more side note about the committees. Mm, we did mm-hmm. actually gain two committee chairs this session. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, well, one in addition to Frank Pallone, Ted Deutsch. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that actually leaves, you know, Medicare for All has to go through a number of committees of jurisdiction for it to get onto the floor for a Mm -hmm. vote. Um, And this means that the only committee of jurisdiction for which we do not have the chair on the bill is Richard Neal. Right. Our very own Richard Neal here in Western Massachusetts, who is the chair of the Ways and Means Committee. It's a burden. Um, Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, we're coming for you, Richie. Um, But uh, that is pretty actually shocking that of the seven committees of jurisdiction we have to go through, six of them are chaired by Medicare for All co-sponsors. Um, so it really is, I feel like our co-sponsor list is breaking into leadership and kind of breaking into the folks who are really running the house and passing through healthcare legislation. Yeah, that has been, mm-hmm. I think, the exciting thing about the developments of the mm-hmm. last couple of years is a mm-hmm. couple of really key committee members, um, Lloyd Doggett and mm-hmm. um, Tony Cardenas, also uh, a new member as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, so there was uh, new sign-ons from established members. Um Mike Quigley, uh, over a mm-hmm. decade in Congress representing Chicago's North Side. Uh, Ted Deutsch, as I just said, um, ethics chair uh, from Florida. And Gregorio Sablon, North Mariana Islands. I actually thought he was on last year, but I, or last session, but I, it mm-hmm. didn't, the co sponsor th- didn't say list. I think he's a non voting member as well in Congress, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Colonialism. Okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Forgot and, about that. The, the colonies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, of course, so Tony Cardenas as well. And then uh, we had these really new uh, first years so that we got to actually see uh, be inducted into con- Congress. And then also on top of that, signed the Medicare for All Bill, eight of them, oh. right? So Jamal Brown, uh, uh, sorry, Jamal Bowman, Mondaire Jones, uh, Richie Torres, Cory Bush, uh, Teresa Lager Fernandez, uh, Nakima Williams, who is replacing John Lewis, um, uh, mm-hmm. Marie Newman, who ousted the anti abortion candidate, Dan mm-hmm. Lipinski. He was like one of the remaining, the last mm-hmm. holdouts, who. Um, who uh, d- he was a Democrat who did not support abortion, um, mm-hmm. and Sarah Jacobs. So we, we picked up a bunch of really new, strong, not just like, you know, uh, uh, people who are signing on uh, because they've been like really pushed, but people I feel uh, there a lot of those those candidates uh, are real true Medicare for all supporters. So that's mm-hmm. that's pretty exciting as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Ben, so that was the good news. What about the bad news? Like, who have we lost? And, you know, who did we expect to get on and didn't? Well, not many uh, losses. Um, we have... Um, we have about five reps who were co-sponsors last session who have not signed on this session yet. But as I kind of mentioned up top, this is pretty common, pretty routine that there will be a handful of reps who like don't jump in in time to be counted as original co-sponsors, but are, they are going to sign back on eventually. Um, they're just processing all 2,000 of the bills that have just been introduced and trying to co-sponsor all of them. Um, so that, that does include Vicente Gonzalez, Zoe Lofgren, Joyce Beatty, and Tim Ryan. Uh, the only one that we worry about is, is Jared Golden in Maine, who we have heard that he's told his constituents he is not going to re-sign on again. Um, I don't know how you explain that one to your constituency, constituents. It's like, oh, yeah, I supported this life-saving issue last year, but now I, yes. I, I change. And, you know, the, usually you can kind of look at their political setting and whether they're being challenged by Republicans, uh, have viable Republican challengers. This is, you know, this is Maine, which is kind of a weird, weird purplish state that elects like, you know, Tea Party Trump, Trump like governors um, and has these centrist Republicans in the Senate. And anyway, we won't go into it all. But um, I think Golden is going to take some real organizing to get back on the other four. We don't have enough information about. Um, and then the last uh, rep I had mentioned is um, uh, Kwaise Mifume, who replaced Elijah Cummings. And Elijah Cummings was a co-sponsor on the bill, obviously. Um, and uh, Mifume has not yet signed on. But again, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count them out yet as potential co-sponsors. So we have a really small, low-hanging fruit list of like uh, five or six reps. Uh, but by and large, almost everyone, I mean, you've already heard that everyone who is a co-sponsor who re ran for re-election won their re-election. Uh, so we have a lot of consistency um, and we had very, very few drop off uh, at the very start of the bill reintroduction. Yep, um, relief. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And speaking of bill reintroduction, um, you know, so there was actually an event, you know, every time the bill is introduced, there's a big press conference. Usually it's on the, the quad in Capitol Hill. It's like outside. They have, you know, people, there's like a rally with people holding signs in the background. A bunch of reps get up and talk. Um, obviously, this was the first kind of virtual uh, bill press conference. It was all done online and Zoom. You can see which reps know how to use Zoom and which don't, um, <laughs> which is always fun. But um, I was I I I have to make a confession, Stephanie. Usually, the bill drop press conference is like very boring. It's very yeah. like oh, it's <laughs> I almost even for didn't me. Listen to it. <laughs> yeah, and this is my whole work. This is my life. It's like it's usually the same people giving like the same speeches and maybe if you're new to the movement or you're new to those people in those speeches, it's exciting. But oh, yeah. for me, like I, didn't hear, yeah. I didn't hear the Bernie Sanders, like we're the only country in the developed right. world who doesn't yes. have, I didn't hear that enough. So now let's like, let's hammer at home a few more times. Really yep. dry. Exactly. So everyone gets the same talking points and kind of reiterates yep. them and, um, they're all, you know, it's always people I like and admire and, but this was, um, I didn't expect to be surprised by this press conference, but I was actually surprised yeah. and it was, turned out to be really impactful. And there was a few nuggets in there that were really, uh, they pointed to some changes happening in our movement and some breakthroughs, I think that we're on the verge of. So why don't we start with the, the reps who spoke at the, who, who kind of gave testimony at the press conference, um, which also was ended up with some surprises in there. Stephanie, were there any like of the reps who talked to like really stuck out to you in particular? Yeah, I always feel like the reps who give their personal stories and I'm actually kind of surprised that, you know, that's become really a thing. You know, I feel that uh, reps like to stay in the safe area of policy sometimes with these things. And um, and so for the ones that did sort of open up uh, and, and talk about their personal histories and struggles with healthcare, it was, I thought, really, it really made an impression on me. I remembered what they said. So one of them was um, Nakima Williams, uh, an Atlanta rep, actually, who she talked about how she chose uh, not to receive medical care after uh, a dangerous car accident that she was in because the visit to the emergency room would be too expensive, uh, and she knew she right. couldn't afford it. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Um, And she also, you know, talked about her struggles to pay for her mom's treatment as she uh, battled stage four cancer in the final years of her life. And just going through, you know, the end of life process right now with uh, my husband, I can tell you that that is the last thing you want to be dealing with right now. Um, And so that was, that hit. Um, And then Cori Bush also gave, you know, she ran, this woman ran for Congress without health insurance. Um, You know, and she talked about dealing with, you know, she was admitted to the hospital last August thinking, you know, she she had pneumonia-like symptoms. She thought she might have COVID. Um, And she's still dealing with the bills (laughs) that she incurred from that visit. Um, And it's just amazing. It's just amazing to finally get some real people in Congress who may have had some health insurance and security or you know, uh, not nearly entering the, the millionaire status of the, you know, the average salary range or income for, for most reps. Um, and I think that's just really 